Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and you're watching this show on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable. The shows are filmed in my garden, and we go through the gardening year uh, in the herb garden, perennial garden, vegetable garden, and shade garden. And then we do a little cooking in the kitchen, often using some of the things that we've picked in the garden, or some of the herbs from the herb garden. I'm starting here in the herb garden today, and today I'm going to pick uh, a couple different things. I'm going to start with a different bouquet, and this one is not edible. It's going to be a group of herbs that will repel insects and possibly mice. And these I will hang in my garden shed, where there may be a problem with both trying to take up residence. And I'm going to start with some of the tansy. All of these herbs have a very pungent odor. This is southern wood. It's a pretty lacy looking thing, but again, it does have a very pungent odor. And these are not edible herbs. They are used, some of them in the past have been used medicinally. They are no longer generally used that way. But they do have a very pungent odor, and that's what repels the mice or the insects. And this one is rue. And I will caution you with rue, if it's a very sunny day and you have sensitive skin, uh, being around the rue can sometimes lead to skin irritation. So be sure to wear gloves if you are one of those people and you won't know until you've encountered it once. I have not had any problems with it, but I know people who have, so it's one to watch out for. There are a number of plants that can cause sensitivity, especially photosensitivity or when the sun is out and bright. Again, I'll just put a rubber band around this and uh, I have a nice little bouquet of herbs to hang in my shed to help repel any critters. The other thing that I wanted to pick today is some uh, sage for drying. Sage is a great herb, and you can use it fresh all season, but it's nice to have some in the winter, too. And even though it's somewhat evergreen, you may not want to come out to the garden. It's a very good herb to dry. It's easy to use. You just crumble it into whatever you're using. And again, I will bundle these with a rubber band. And these I'll take in the house and hang probably in my dining room, which tends to be cool, dark, and dry, and let them dry. Then I can crumble it into a jar, and we can use that in some of the dishes this winter. It's very good with sausage, apples, that sort of thing in the winter time. Other herbs that we're going to use today are some of the oregano. It has started to flower but I'll use some of the leaves further down on the stalk and try to take it from stems that haven't flowered quite yet. Herbs are best if you can use them before they flower, but it's still possible to use the leaves after they've flowered. And of course, some of them don't flower until quite a bit later, like the mint. That will come later and we can use that any time. It's been a little dry the last few days and we got used to a lot of rain. Uh, today is a beautiful day, low humidity, and just probably one of the top ten for the season. Uh, but it is a little dry, so some of the annuals in here, like the scented geraniums and the new comfrey that I planted, do need a little drink. So later this evening, I will come out and give them a little drink of water. Right now we have garlic chives that are in flower. They are a broadleaf chive, and you can use both the leaves and the flowers on these. I wouldn't use a whole flower in anything because they are quite strong. You'd want to just use some of the florets or, or pieces of the blossom if you use it as a garnish on anything. Other herbs are growing down in the vegetable garden, and some herbs here are going to seed. This is a fennel. And fennel seed is good in uh, a number of baked goods and other dishes. And I will let this seed 
and uh, probably come out with a paper bag to put over the top so that I won't lose too much of the seed on the ground. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. Here in the perennial garden, some things have stopped blooming and others are starting to bloom. That's the plan, to have something in bloom almost all season. It's a good plan if you expect to have a lot of pollinators and butterflies because they like to have something for all seasons, the pollinators particularly. I will go through though and deadhead things somewhat, just for neatness. And this is a Heliopsis or sunflower. And I'll take some of the oldest blooms off. I may leave a few for the birds because they do like the seed heads, but I don't want too much of it to go to seed in this location. I've added another pot of the Nicotiana uh, flowering tobacco, and that will give me some white spikes a little later. This one is a sea lavender, and uh, it basically just has tiny little blooms that can dry very nicely. I've already deadheaded all of the daylilies. They have finished blooming for the season, except for a few that have reblooms like Happy Returns or Stella Doro. They will send up bloom shoots all the way till frost. But most of the ones I have have one large blooming period and then they're finished. I like to take off the seed heads because I don't think they add anything and they turn brown rather quickly. This is a Eupatorium chocolate, and it will have white flowers. Its dark foliage has added some texture to the garden all season, and we will have some white flowers on that, as well as white flowers on the Boltonia, which is in uh, the far back corner, which has little white daisies on it that look a lot like asters, but they aren't. The aliums have been blooming. Those are the little balls on the long stalks and uh, they are in the onion family. And as soon as they're finished and have completely gone to, not to seed yet, but formed a little seed heads, I will pick those and use them in fall decorations. This is Verbena bonariensis, and it has been a favorite of the butterflies all season. It's a reblooming annual, although I've had some that I swear are perennial, they seem to come up. So I won't, definitely won't, dig it out this fall. I'll leave it and see what it does. But I will let this one reseed too, because I'd like more to come up. The butterflies love it. It's what we call a see-through plant. It's fairly tall, but you can see right through it to the things behind it. I have butterfly weed, some that's uh, formed a seed pod. I'm gonna save some seeds from that so that I can plant some more. Uh, when the seed pods start to open, I will get out and, and pick those. The roses are in their second flush of bloom, large, larger flush of bloom. I do deadhead them. We've had a few Japanese beetles. Those I have hand-picked. They have not been so numerous as to be a big problem. Uh, they are very easy to hand-pick if you just come out. You can put them into a can of soapy water or just squash them if you're wearing gloves. I will deadhead the rose, but I won't fertilize the roses anymore this season. It's time for them to start thinking about getting ready for cooler weather. And we don't want to encourage soft growth because that will be very vulnerable to colder temperatures. One of the things I do want to do is spread some seeds of an annual poppy. And these are uh, a type that will reseed. And rather than trying to start these tiny seeds and planting them out very early next spring, this is a purple one. I have pink ones that you've seen here before. I'm gonna put down my little basket. And I'm going to find a place to scatter a few of these and see if perhaps they will decide to come up. I will need to come out with a stake that tells me where I put them, otherwise I might dig them. And this is a little open spot, so it would be nice to have some of these 
lavender plants right in this area. So I'll scatter the seeds there and hope for the best. I might save a few and try the winter seeding with them, but I think this may work because the others are ready to reseed right now themselves, which takes us to saving some seeds. The larkspur has been pretty all season. It's been blooming in these lovely blue blooms. And as you can see, it's now got seed pods on it. And those seed pods are spreading seeds that will come up next year here in the garden. But if I wish to share these or to plant them someplace else, I can just collect them. And I use a plastic cup and just open up the little pods before they open themselves, which they will, and empty them into the cup. Even though we're still in summer, I'm still starting to think about the next garden season and the end of this one. And saving seeds is always good to do. But it needs to be done at the right time. You can always pick out the uh, pod material a little later. You'll remember the pineapple lilies that we've had in the pots. They are a bulb, a summer bulb, uh, begonias and some of the iris are also summer bulbs. But this one is a little different and you can see why now why it's called a pineapple lily. I have this one which is, uh, has a kind of a purple and white bloom. And then further down we have a white one. And I'm going to move down to that area. Let me put these seeds away. And I'll move down a little ways to the other one. As I move down, you'll see that there's some heliotrope here. And this is an annual. Uh, I replace it every year. It's just a lovely, lovely plant that blooms all season. Annuals, again, will get more fertilizer and water as we go through until frost, whereas the perennials will hopefully not need extra water or for, and we don't fertilize those. Again, they need to get ready for winter. This is a chrysanthemum that's about ready to bloom. And there are asters in back that again will be blooming later. Here's the other pineapple lily. This is a white one, and it has little black dots around the uh, inside of the flower. I think it's an attractive plant. This one needs dividing, which brings me to my clipboard. And I have it divided into sections called Remove, Move, Divide, and Add. So I can add pineapple lily, white, to the plants that are going to need to be divided next year. I'm going to go through the garden in its entirety one day and make notations on this. I'll do most of my dividing in the spring and most of my moving, so I need to know what I need to move. In the spring, it's really hard to tell because everything's tiny and you don't realize how big it's going to get before the season's finished. The same with dividing things. Some things really need dividing. This is a, a colorful yarrow, and again, it's, it's already kind of outside its area. We have a nice hummingbird moth that's on it. It looks like a hummingbird, but it's actually a moth. I don't know if the camera can catch that one or not as it buzzes around. I have quite a few of those. They look like something between a bumblebee and a hummingbird. 
but they are a hummingbird moth. We also have lots of butterflies flying around. And in late August, it's time to think about what do you want next spring for bulbs. And I've got a ton of catalogs here, bulb catalogs, all of them. And they're fun to look through right now. It's good to sit in a shady spot and check out the bulb catalogs and decide what you want. If, as I recommended, you made a list of open spots when your bulbs were blooming last spring, you'll know what you need to fill those spots and you can place your order now. Some of the companies even offer early order discounts, so it's worth it to think about it now and not wait until all the things that you might have wanted are gone. Uh, ordering online gives you the most variety. Many of the garden centers do carry bags of bulbs at this season, but your biggest variety will be found by ordering online or from catalogs. So now's the time to get the bulbs and get them ready to go. I also ordered garlic for my vegetable garden. I've used the garlic that I harvested in past years uh, to start the next year's crop, but every once in a while I like to get a new kind and a new group of garlic sets to put in the vegetable garden. I'm gonna come down here and These are the uh, poppies that have been blooming in a beautiful pink. They're the ruffled pink ones, and I'm going to save their seed. As soon as uh, the tops of these poppies turn a little brown, you can just turn them over, unlike the oriental poppies, and seeds will spill out. I'll let my seeds that I've collected stay inside on a shelf in a, in a cool sheltered spot until they're thoroughly dry and then I'll put them into little bags and save them for planting. These can be shared almost immediately for people who want to scatter them. As these will scatter themselves, there will be many seeds here that actually scatter themselves. And once I have removed the seeds, I can pull up the poppies themselves and uh, put the rest of the plant in the compost. But I can also take these seeds if I want the poppies to bloom someplace else. I have a, a couple more areas where I already have them, and I think I will probably just keep saving the seeds and sharing them with other people. Now let's head over to the vegetable garden and see what's going on there. It's not too late to plant some things in the vegetable garden. There's still time for lettuce, uh, baby kale, arugula and radishes to give you a crop before the first frost of the year along with all the other vegetables that are in the garden and already producing. But one of the things I want to plant now particularly is spinach. Spinach prefers a cooler weather and though today isn't exactly cool, uh, the weather will be starting to cool off as we get into September. We need to plant it in about mid-August and we are in mid-August so I'm going to start by planting some, and I've uh, put some compost. I've dug a furrow, and this is where the peas were earlier, which I took out, and the fence has been taken down. And we had a trench under the string, and I'm going to add spinach, and I'm going to plant it fairly thickly in this area and see if we can get a nice fall crop. I'll just kind of broadcast some of the seeds. And I'll put a rock in at the beginning and the end of my row so I know that I've planted something there. And then we'll cover them with about a quarter inch of soil. Now the important thing, once you've planted something like this, is to keep it watered, and watered pretty well until it germinates. That means I may be out here both morning and evening for a week or so, 
until these plants come up and then make sure that they get plenty of water as time goes by. This area is slightly shaded by the plants around it, so that may help keep it a little cooler as well. And I can put more straw a little closer to the plants to again help keep them cool. Everything's grown up here around everything, so it's hard to see. But I'm also going to plant some kale mix. And this would be uh, harvested in the fall as baby kale. And if we're lucky, it will last through the winter and come up in the spring. And again, I'm going to just spread it on top of this layer of compost. Hopefully we'll see some spinach coming up here when we meet again. Our raspberries, the later raspberries are now uh, still going. And I'm able to pick a cup or so every couple days. Uh, they'll last as long as we have rain and uh, as long as I keep the nets on. The birds sometimes yell at me because I have a net over them, but I wouldn't get any at all if I didn't because they love them as much as I do. I do have a bush type squash, winter squash. It went in a little late, but it's already got a little squash on it, so hopefully we'll have a nice butternut squash on that vine. My flowers have started to bloom, zinnias, calendulas, and uh, a marigold that was shared with me by a friend. This is a tall marigold version, uh, something new to me, but it's very pretty. And we have plenty of lettuce. I have beets that we can pick. These are uh, golden beets. This is a good sized one. And that can be roasted in the oven and then cut up and consumed or used in salad. Some of the lettuce is starting to go to seed. Uh, I'm picking it as fast as I can and we're eating salad quite frequently. I have broccoli that has not done well this year so far, but it's starting to do much better as the cool weather comes and the insects that like broccoli are decreased and uh, we have several nice sized heads on the broccoli. These are lima beans. They're covered with blossoms right now and they're also covered with pods in some areas. You can see the pods, but they need to fill with the lima beans before we pick them and we're a ways from that, several weeks at least. Green beans, I'm getting a few. Uh, they, I like to pick them when they're in about this stage, just uh, very small and tender. Uh, yellow beans the same way. That means I'm out here every day or every other day checking the plants to see what I can pick. My strawberry patch has been disappointing this year. Every other year by now, I've had runners that go every which way. This year they aren't doing it. It may be time to get new plants. About every five years, the patch kind of loses its steam. We had a great harvest this year, and I'll give it a little more time, but it may be time to think about putting in new ones next spring and foregoing strawberries for a year until those plants establish. I'm still able to pick kale, and I have some miniature cabbages over here that will be ready very soon. Tomatoes, lots of green ones. A few cherries that we're picking already. These seldom make it into the house, by the way. They get consumed right out here. And the yellow pear tomatoes. Again, there's something that can be picked right now. I'm still waiting for my main season tomatoes. The borage is attracting pollinators like crazy. We've got honeybees, bumblebees, and uh, all sorts of pollinators, which are very good for my flowers and my vegetables and for all of the plants in the area. Someone must have a beehive nearby because I have had 
lots and lots of honeybees this year. And they seem to love this flower particularly. It's a very pretty one and it, the blossoms are edible. The other side of the garden, if you could see around that far, I have my uh, summer squash and we've had regular pickings of yellow squash and zucchini. So basically, I just walk right by the vegetable section of the supermarket these days and come out here right before dinner and pick something. The cucumber is finally producing and we're getting some lovely cucumbers from this plant. Pick one of the ones in this area. And also summer squash. I have both uh, yellow crookneck, or actually they aren't crookneck, they're straight neck this year. I like to pick those when they're fairly young. And I guess this one needs picking more. Very quickly, very quickly do these grow. So again, every few days, if you're gone for a week, you'll come home to many, many squash if you aren't having someone pick for you. The other ones are zucchinis, and as I've said before, I like to grow the round ones. They're a little different, but they uh, taste very good. They're, they have a nice flavor, and we've enjoyed them. They're called eight balls, and it's good to pick them when they're about eight ball size. So we have a couple of these. I probably have, yep, there's a couple more. Again, every few days, we're getting a nice harvest of these. Now let me put my vegetables down, and I have a few flowers back here too. Early in the season, after the danger of frost was over, I brought out the amaryllis plants that were inside the house. Uh, they had bloomed in February and March to give us some indoor color, and they're spending their summer vacation outside. And what I'm doing now is I planted them in this area, and I want to keep them watered and fertilized. I have uh, liquid fertilizer in the water. And grow as much bulb as we possibly can before I dig them up and let them dry. And then we'll plant them again and start the process over again. Some of these bulbs will bloom again this spring, hopefully, and others may take a year or so before they have succeeded in reaching enough size to bloom. But it is possible to keep them over. If you get one as a Christmas plant, or a bulb that's already established, you can keep them over, set them out in the summer, then we'll take them in and let them dry, and then we can plant them again and start over. This is kind of a jumble of items. Uh, I have some pumpkins behind the fence which have decided to come in front of the fence. I planted one of the canna lilies. I had some extra, so I planted that here. And we put in a dahlia again last spring. There was just one bulb planted here, but you can see the beautiful dahlia flowers that have come from that one bulb. Uh, they really are pretty. And that was a bulb that has been blooming in this garden for three years. Again, I dig it in the fall, I take it in, it stays in a cool bedroom all winter. Uh, the root portion of it, uh, completely dry, and then we plant it again in the spring, and by now we have the flowers. I also have some beans back here. These are a special bean. My husband attended a program last year on uh, the Seneca Indians, and one of the people presenting it had an heirloom bean plant that their family had planted for many, many, many years. And he shared the seeds with my husband. You can see that beans don't typically have these pink and red lovely blooms. I'm anxious to see what the beans look like. And I hope we do get some because the man also asked him to please share the seed back with him if we were successful in growing the plant. So far, it's been quite successful, but hopefully our season's long enough to have it form the pods and the peas. And I'll keep watching it to see if we get something that we can send back to the man since he was kind enough to share the seeds with us. 
Seed sharing is a lot of fun, and that's one of the reasons I do collect seeds from my garden and from other plants, even wild plants, so that I can share them and also grow them. Now let's go back to the patio where I have some cuttings. Last month we did some soft wood cuttings of shrubs. Today I want to plant some tender annuals so that we can have some starts for next year. There are a variety of these that you can start. And uh, I'm going to start with a, a geranium. And basically I want to just take short amounts and I'll be dipping that again in the rooting powder. It's a hormone that helps with the rooting process. And then I have put compost in these pots and I can plant a couple in each one, two or three. And we'll just put them in and push them in fairly tight and keep on going and then we'll water the whole thing at the end. This is a purple spider wart. And again, I'm going to take off many of the leaves. The roots often start at a leaf axle. This one is quite easy to root. I have a couple of these we'll be putting in. And again, the majority of the leaves will come off until we just have a little bit. A pencil makes a good uh, tool to make a hole in the soil. I can put three of these in. Again, this breaks pretty easily. Not all of them will take, but my goal is to get one or two of each as we go. I use compost. You can also use uh, potting soil. This is a Plectoranthus, uh, which has been a, a good filler for me. I'm going to leave these right here on this table. And add to it as I go. I won't cover this one. I'm just going to leave it here and keep it well watered. This is another type of Plectoranthus. I had these cuttings in a little water. And again, taking off some of the lower leaves so that it has energy to root. But you don't have to keep them in water. We can go right over here to the coleus, which is uh, another plant that roots quite easily. And I'll pick a few of those, just taking the top sections. And there are several different kinds here and different colors. And again, these also root quite easily. And you can save them over. Leaving them out in the uh, weather, they will not survive. But by taking cuttings, you can nurture them inside all winter and then put them out again in the spring. I'll be putting in more as time goes by, keeping them watered. And before long, when you tug a little bit on them, you'll find some resistance, and that means they've formed roots and are starting to grow. About the time I take these inside for the winter, it will be time to repot them. You'll notice I'm putting three or four, up to four in each little pot, but I will divide them so that each plant has its own pot, and then these can be kept under lights inside in the winter or in a sunny window and kept watered and fertilized, and hopefully you'll have new plants to set out next spring. And you can add others to them to make a complete display. I had saved both of these last year, 
and you can see that the starts that I put in took off when they were put outside. And I only had to buy the red one and uh, another purple one that's in back. Another thing that you can do now is pick the hydrangeas. And I have a bush of them right here. And they've turned from white to a creamy yellow or green. And they're ready to be picked and dried. And I can just gather these in a basket. Some of them have already turned a bit brown. Those I will probably not keep. I have some uh, in the front that are the blue hydrangeas. Those I probably will keep. They still have a tinge of blue color. Uh, you can also put them in water and uh, save them that way. I kind of like them piled in a basket as a fall decoration. And uh, we'll just set those right in here and continue picking the hydrangeas as we go. I always leave a few just to, so the bush doesn't look empty. Now let's go back to the backyard and the shade garden. Various hostas have been blooming for the last month or so. You can see they come in different colors, uh, from pure white to pale, pale lavender to a rather dark lavender. And once these blooms have finished, I will cut off the bloom stalks just for neatness. I think they're quite attractive, especially some of these with the dark purple color and purple stripes inside. Uh, white ones that have are the latest ones to bloom, and they will bloom not only late, but have a lovely fragrance. I have a hillebore here that is blooming. Uh, they don't typically bloom this time of year, but I've read it does happen, and this is the second year for this one to bloom. Also, the uh, flower on it is quite different than some of my others. This is probably one that is a hybrid between several varieties that I have in the garden. And I'm gonna keep track of it because it's uh, Interesting to me that it has uh, continued to bloom in the fall each year. Uh, a little unusual, and I may have discovered something new. Who knows? Now let's head back by the garden shed. Last year I grew bottle gourds, and I got, I only planted a couple plants, and I got three nice bottle gourds. They sat in my shed all winter, which is what they need to do. They need to freeze and thaw a few times and get very hard, which this one has. I'm gonna make a birdhouse out of this one. But the first thing I have to do is sand it off. And you can use sandpaper, but truth be told, I'll probably get out my uh, power sander and go over this gourd to get off any of the old skin. And then it can be painted. I can put a hole in it. They actually are not too difficult to just use a knife or a drill to drill a hole. For birds, about an inch is good for wrens. And then I can paint the gourd and uh, decorate it and we have a nice little craft to put out in the garden next year when the birds are nesting. Uh, it takes a while for these gourds to mature. But we'll keep it sanded down and uh, you'll see how it turns out. I've been using my, my uh, water plant fertilizer each month and I've already done it for August. Uh, I may fertilize them once more in September. These are all plants that will be coming in the house for the winter. So I don't have to worry about them hardening off for winter. I want to keep them going. And need to get out some shears here. The garlic we harvested almost a month ago, and I've had it here in the shed with the door open and the window open, and uh, it's kept dry, but it's time now to uh, get it ready for storage. So I'll cut off the root area and cut off the stems about half to an inch above the bulbs. And then I will uh, wipe them off well, or use a brush, uh, just a scrub brush works really well, or an old nail brush. And we'll get them fairly clean. 
And then I'll just put them in a mesh bag. They need to be kept in an airy spot. I uh, keep these in my garage, kind of by the back door. It never freezes there, but it does stay very cool. And my garlic will last then until maybe April or May even, as long as it's been cured, which is what we've done by keeping it in the shed. Now there's one more plant I'd like to show you that's in bloom right now, and you can almost smell it over the video. It's so fragrant. If you've been driving around Norfolk with the windows down, especially through areas that are a little on the damp side, uh, you've undoubtedly smelled an undescribably sweet fragrance at this time of year. And that fragrance is coming from a plant called Clithera. It is a native plant, although there are some hybrids which are smaller than this. This is the native version. And it is, has a delightful scent to these white and pink spiky flowers. And uh, it is a native plant. Pollinators love it. Uh, you have to be careful putting your nose into it that you don't put your nose on a bee. But uh, it is what you smell as you go down the street. I've had people ask, what is that delightful smell? And that's what it is. I myself encountered it when I first moved here, had to find out what it was, and ended up getting three bushes of it to have in my yard so that I could enjoy it right here. Uh, it's a plant worth knowing. Again, it's a, a native plant that pollinators love. So it's good for the environment. And I think it's attractive too. You can also pick the flower spikes and they last a while inside. So you can bring it right inside and have the lovely fragrance. It's uh, one of the most fragrant plants in the garden. It's also known as pepper bush because its old blooms form seeds that look like pepper, though they aren't used as such. Uh, that's how it got its common name of pepper bush. But Clithera is the name. And uh, I enjoy it. It's one of the joys of August. Now let's go inside and do some cooking. Today in the kitchen, we're going to use some of the things from the garden and other things that I don't grow that are nonetheless in season at the farm stands, at farmers markets, and even the grocery store. Today I'm going to use some peaches. Most of the peaches that we buy here could use a few days on the counter to ripen up a little more. They're a lot easier to peel if they're fully ripe and they taste a lot better too. If you have your own peach tree, that's not a problem because you can wait until they're fully ripe to pick them. However, the farmers can't wait that long and still have them ship without bruising. So that's why the peaches in the store are a little hard and a ripe peach is soft, a little soft, and easier to peel and eat. I've added to the peaches some fruit fresh and fruit fresh is um, something you can use on fruit that prevents browning and I peeled these in advance so I wanted to add something so they wouldn't be all brown by the time we got here. And fruit uh, fresh is ascorbic acid. And ascorbic acid is the chemical name of vitamin C. That's all it is. It's not any dangerous thing, uh, man-made chemical. It's a vitamin C. And it's uh, very good for anti-browning of fruit. And I just stirred in half a teaspoon of it. I've made some pastry. And I'm going to roll that out right on my baking sheet. It's a lot easier this way. And you could also use a store-bought pastry circle. I'll turn this and I want to have a about a 12 to 14 inch circle. That should do it. And now I will add to about a quarter cup of sugar, two tablespoons of instant clear gel. And this is a uh, thickener that works very well in fruit pies. And it helps them uh, not juice all over the place. 
I'm also going to add just a pinch of nutmeg. Just for a little extra flavor. Maybe a, a little extra pinch. And I'll stir that into the peaches. You don't want to uh, add sugar to any fruit until right before you cook it, if you're cooking it in a pie or tart, because the sugar will cause the juice from the peaches to flow freely. And you don't want to encourage that before it has time to thicken up. I'm also going to stir in about half of a half a cup of red raspberries. And these are from the garden, of course. And then I'll put those right on top of the pastry. Make sure there's it's well mixed. And I want to put it right in the middle. And then I'm going to fold the pastry up around the peaches. Folding it if necessary around the edges. This is a freeform tart. And we're basically just encasing the edges of the peaches with the pastry. And then put it into a 450 oven for about 40 to 45 minutes. I'm going to set the timer for 40. It's always good to set the timer for a little less than you think it might take. And we can also turn on the oven light to keep track of it. While that bakes, I'm going to make some soup. And this is a butternut squash and chicken soup. I'm going to get my chicken out of the refrigerator. And in my soup kettle, I've added a tablespoon of oil. And we'll heat that up on high. And I'll put the chicken in and brown it a bit. And while that's browning, I can assemble my other items, which will include onion and garlic and several seasonings. And then uh, some red pepper, mm -hmm. squash, broth, tomatoes. It's nice to have everything assembled in advance. But you do have a little time while that chicken's starting to brown. Now that our chicken is browned a bit, I'm going to add a small yellow onion, which has been chopped, and one clove of garlic, which has been minced. Mincing is chopping a little finer than chopping. And we'll let those cook for a few minutes. In with the chicken and the oil. I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of salt. Put that back up on the shelf. And we're going to shred in about a quarter of a teaspoon of black pepper, freshly ground. and half a teaspoon of ground cumin. And a tablespoon of minced fresh oregano. If you were using dried oregano, you would use one teaspoon. But uh, fresh oregano, 
you use three times as much. So three times one teaspoon is a tablespoon. Next we're going to add, uh, getting ahead of myself, black, uh, some red pepper. Half of large red pepper, which has been diced. And again, I'll cook that around. Mix it and cook it a little bit. I'm going to add two cups of chicken broth. One can of diced tomatoes, or in this case, a full cup of diced fresh tomatoes, juice and all. Two cups of diced butternut squash. and one cup of black beans. I'll bring this to a boil and then we'll let it simmer for 30 minutes until the chicken is completely done. And chicken needs to be on a meat thermometer or if you have one of these instant read thermometers your chicken needs to be 165 degrees to be done and to be safe. So always uh, use a thermometer. You can't really tell just by looking uh, if the chicken is completely done. A thermometer is a sure way to make sure your chicken is safe and done. And 165 is the amount that is recommended for cooked chicken. And we'll make sure that we've tested this to make sure that it is completely done. And of course our squash needs to cook as well. So once I get this to a good boil, I'll turn the heat way down and we'll just let it simmer for 30 minutes. Another thing I want to get ready is uh, our bread. And what I'll do is melt some butter in the other burner. And I have two cloves of garlic. I'm gonna make some garlic bread. And into the butter, I'm going to press two cloves of garlic. Rather than, uh, this gets it very fine, which is what I want to do. In with the butter. And rather than chopping it, this is a much easier way to get it very, very fine. And I'll just clean out any extra in there and we'll discard that. Garlic bread is a great thing to do if you have pieces of bread hanging around uh, the end of loaves, keels, whatever you have as you know the last part of the loaf. It's a little bit stale uh, so you really want to do something with it. You can make croutons out of it. That's another use for bread that's a little older. But garlic bread is a fun thing to make, too. And what I'm going to do is melt the butter and garlic together. It's very simple to make. And again, we can use some of that fresh garlic that we have harvested from the garden. It's now melted and I'm just going to paint each piece with the garlic butter. Give it a nice nice coating of garlic butter. And then I'm going to sprinkle it with some Parmesan cheese. A little paprika. 
just to add some color. This is now ready to go under the broiler for a few minutes right before our soup is finished and our peach tart has already come out of the oven. It's time to take our peach tart out of the oven. It looks like uh, it has leaked a little bit on the pan, which will soak off nicely. And I'm going to turn on the broiler so that we can do our garlic bread. And we'll take this, uh, the peach tart off of the pan, loosen it up, and put it onto a serving plate. And I saved, remember the raspberries that I saved? We'll use those to decorate the top a little bit. And that's ready. Now let's check the soup and see how that's doing. And I'm going to take the chicken out and shred it. Everything seems to be done. The squash is soft. The chicken is done. Some of it has even shredded itself into the pan here. And what's left, I will just shred a little bit. I think uh, another thing that could be added to this soup, we have uh, red pepper and tomatoes, onions. I imagine that if you had a leftover ear of sweet corn, that wasn't consumed, you could also add that to the soup here at the end. For a little extra flavor. dish some of this up and then, but I'll add my garlic toasts we want to serve those with the soup so we'll put those under the broiler for a few minutes until that parmesan cheese gets nice and melty and in the meantime I'll serve up a bowl of our butternut squash and chicken soup some of the nice broth. It's almost like a stew. You might wish to add a little more broth even in the process. And I'm going to garnish that with a little fresh parsley from the garden. If you have the herbs it's so nice to use them and parsley kind of dresses it up and will add a little extra flavor. Time to take the garlic toasts out of the oven under the broiler. And we'll put those on a plate. To be served along with our soup. meal of uh, butternut squash and chicken soup with garlic toasts and for dessert a peach freeform tart with raspberries. I'm Liz Davey. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television, and we'll see you again soon when we're in the garden again. Mm -hmm.